Fibsborough is a place that has changed much through the ages, but one thing has remained constant here for more than a century, the presence of association football or soccer. Before there was even an Irish state, the Irish national team were playing here. Bohemians and Shelburne FC, the two elder statesmen of the game in Dublin, played their first ever match in Dalymount Park. And now a new chapter is about to begin as they prepare to share this historic place. From its very humble beginnings, the game has evolved into something spectacular. And now Dublin is about to experience a festival of football that the founders of the game here could only imagine, Euro 2020. Two billion people watched Euro 2016, and four games now here in Dublin will allow us to showcase this city and its rich footballing tradition on the world stage. These days, things are eerily quiet around the laneways of Dalymount Park and the famous Dalymount roar can't be heard. But despite that, there is an air of great excitement about this place. 2021 marks the centenary of the Football Association of Ireland, an organisation committed to the development of the game. And Dalymount Park, the spiritual home of Irish football, is going to change enormously in the near future. But at the beginning, it's important to get a sense of just where this place came from. The early days of this stadium are well captured in Tony Reid's official history of Bohemian Football Club. In it, Tony writes that the official opening ceremony of Dalymount Park took place on the 7th of September 1901, when the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Mr Tim Harrington, hoisted the red and black colours of the club. He then kicked off the start of an exhibition match, which was played to celebrate the opening of the ground between Bohemians and Shelburne. On St Stephen's Day 1901, the famous Glasgow Celtic played in Dalymount. In this fashion, Bohemians were able to let the Dublin public see for themselves some of the greatest players of association football. It was a move that gave soccer in the city its best ever boost. Dalymount was now truly the mecca of football in Southern Ireland. Down the years since that day in 1901, Bohemians and Ireland have brought the great clubs and great teams to Dalymount Park. So Cormac, you as a historian are very interested in the, the history of, of sports in Ireland, soccer in Ireland. Both Bohemians and Shelburne are born in the, the 1890s, the very end of the, the 19th century. Could give us a sense of the, the context of the time in terms of soccer. How did it arrive uh, in Ireland and indeed here in Dublin? Um, so the arrival of, of soccer in Ireland, really, uh, we need to go up to the north, to, to Belfast primarily. Um, although there have been uh, some evidence of games played play throughout the country, the game actually took root in Belfast from the late 1870s. Um, you have clubs like Cliftonville in particular um, and, and other clubs like Distillery setting up the, the Irish Football Association in Belfast in 1880. Most of the, the main teams played um, that were involved in soccer then were from Belfast or the hinterlands and with some in Derry and Armagh and so on. Soccer only started to really um, come to Dublin by, um, by the time the IFA was set up um, in early early 1880s. Um, you had the Dublin, uh, Dublin Association Football Club, then you had a football club in Trinity College, Dublin, um, and then you had Nomads. Um, it, it took a long time for uh, football in Dublin to um, catch up with uh, Belfast. Um, and, and it was really with the founding of clubs such as Bohemians in 1890 and Shelburne in 1895 that there, there was this uh, um, great catching up which took place from 1900s onwards when Bowes and Shells started to win the most uh, blue ribbon trophy, the Irish Cup, from that decade onwards. And it's kind of like a, a gentleman's game, you might say. I know Cliftonville were also a, a cricket club, but there's a bit of that at Bowes uh, as well. Like, what, who are, the, who are the, the founding fathers, if you will, of soccer in, in Dublin? Yeah, and again, the, the football in Dublin, it, its foundations is very different than in the North. Where North has a very plebeian, kind of working class feel to it, from all the migrants from Scotland and England, just walking the shipyards in, in, in linen industries and so on. Whereas Dublin, it's, it's more um, from an educational institution point of view, where soccer takes root. Um, people like uh, you know, Clongo's College in Kildare, and you've got Castlenock College here. And it's actually from Castlenock that a lot of uh, 
uh, players um, from Bowes come from. So, and that actually caused problems as well. It was actually seen as, in Dublin initially as a bit of an elitist concern. It was only from the 20th century that it, it becomes more of a working class uh, sport in the city. Bohemians are just over a decade old, 11 years old. Uh, Shelburne, six years old when, when this place was born, Daly Mount Park, 1901. This is very much the, the jewel in the crown, is it, in, in, in the early years of soccer in Dublin? Yeah, so you had the two big grounds of football in Ireland were Windsor Park in Belfast and Daly Mount Park in Dublin. And although the, um, there were very few um, Irish internationals played in Dublin, like only six um, up to 1921 when the Irish split, split happened, um, most of them were actually held in uh, in Daly Mount Park. So it takes on a huge spiritual role. It's, it's the home of Bohemians and it also then becomes the home of the FAI's Irish teams um, um, from 1920 onwards and plays host to a number of, of very significant and very famous internationals. The ground, as I suppose parts of it even today, still have the, the appearance of that kind of time, the, the yeah. very end of the Victorian age. Soccer was booming in, in these islands. It was very much the, the working man's game and, and the cheap tickets on the terrace. Yeah, look, look, and uh, it, 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 was, it was not. Look, people often say that you know why did uh, soccer take hold within one community or, or the other? But it was always going to be popular with all communities. It is a truly international game, and it really mushroomed in popularity after the First World War, um, and became truly, you know, a, a, a truly global international sport played by people of all different religions, different uh, geographic backgrounds. But, but yeah, obviously, uh, clearly more so within working class uh, environments. As you enter Daly Mount Park today, it's the name Bohemian FC that greets you, and you find it here in the changing rooms as well. Bohemians, the gypsies, went on their own journey from the time of their foundation until they found this place, and they have plenty of legends synonymous with Daly Mount Park. There was Harold Sloan, who scored the first ever goal in Daly Mount in a 4-2 victory over Shelburne Football Club. Harold Sloan, like so many young Irishmen, lost his life in the First World War. He died in early 1917. But even Shelburne have their Daily Mount legends. It was here for many, many years that the FAI Cup was contested. The future of this historic stadium lies with both Bohemian Football Club and Shelburne Football Club. Gav, could you give me a sense of the journey for Shelburne Football Club, where you began, uh, the beginnings of, of, the, of the team? It's a, it's a, it's a long journey. Um, founded in 1895 on, on Shelburne Road. Um, it's a journey that's taken us around Dublin, um, to Daly Mount Park here, obviously Talker Park over the last 30 years or so, um, Harold's Cross, and obviously our spiritual home in Ring's End. Um, along that journey, it's picked up a lot of Dublin characters, and, and to those characters and, and supporters, Shelburne Football Club means a, a traditional Dublin. Um, and through that 126 years now, uh, it's a lot of highs, a lot of lows, um, but the character and the values of the club has stayed through throughout those whole, uh, 126 years. And Daly Mount is in its own way a part of, of Shelburne history. There's been some, some legendary nights here for, for the team. There has been some very successful nights here. Um, if you go back to the 60s, you know, we most famously played Barcelona here after going to the new Camp, taking the lead there through an early penalty before ultimately losing 3-1. But, you know, we played Barcelona, Atletico Madrid, Sporting Lisbon, uh, and we even beat Belenenses from Portugal here in, in a great European night. That also then came into the, into the 90s. Uh, we won the, you know, back-to-back -back cup success with 96-97. Um, and then we, we won the double, our, our only double in Daly Mount Park in, in a replay here against Bohemian Football Club. And you know, ultimately, we look back on those years with, with, with great success and the great years of Jerry Doyle. Tolga Park also has a very proud footballing history. It was synonymous with the great drum Condra drums back in the day. But for Shelburne fans, there's a real emotional power in, in Tolga Park too. Hugely. Um, I talked about success there in previous years. There's huge success in Talker Park. Um, you know, if you go back to the early 2000s, uh, huge, great, great nights against Hadrick Split going on to the Deportivo game in Lansdowne Road. League successes, uh, un unbridled success that we've had. And ultimately, <laughs> the, the low came then as well in, in 2006 when, you know, financial um, crisis came in. And, but ultimately, I think being in Tolga Park until recently allows us to be able to look towards the future with, with you know, rebuilding that success. Um, and throughout those 126 years, you don't go through um, a journey without highs and lows. 
And going forwards for, for Shelburne Football Club, this is obviously a very new chapter, but in its own way, it, it, it's very exciting for the club to, to come to Daily Mount. It is, but we talk about Talker Park and there's a huge emotional connection to the Talker Park for our supporters. You know, a lot of our supporters would have ashes from the loved ones on the ground. Lots of famous nights where they would have meet friends and family and, you know, there's a huge kind of connection with our supporters there. So, you know, we look to, to, to a redeveloped Daily Mount Park as a, a brand new journey and an opportunity to, to um, regain that success that we've had throughout those years. Um, if, Ultimately, it'll be an amazing stadium. Um, it'll be a totally new uh, era for the club, for both clubs, um, and it'll give us the springboard to, to be able to achieve that success. So what did the Daily Mount Park of the early days look like? Well, it looked absolutely nothing like this. Football stadiums in the late 19th and early 20th centuries were much humbler affairs. Think kind of small wooden stands. But everything was transformed by Archibald Leach. From Scotland and a trained engineer, he is very much the architectural father of the modern football stadium in these islands. He began in 1899 with Ibrox, stadium of his boyhood heroes, Glasgow Rangers. But right across these islands, Glasgow, Birmingham, Manchester, and here in Dublin, we find the vision of Archibald Leach. The iconic floodlights, well, they came later on in the 1960s, 1962 to be exact. A long-standing urban myth in the League of Ireland has it that they came from Arsenal's home in London. They didn't, like Archibald Leach himself, they came from Scotland. In terms of your research and, and, and the books you've written, uh, I think one of the things I really like about Daily Mount Park is that the Uchtaron from just up the road, Michael D. Higgins is a, is a regular here. There have been moments of great controversy in, in the history of, of this stadium, and one in particular stands out, which was the, the visit of Douglas Hyde. That picture hangs in Daily Mount. Uh, yeah, today. but it's in my first book, the GA versus Douglas Hyde, and I, I do love that story, if, and, and it was. It still amuses me that uh, the GA made that decision to, um, to remove Douglas Hyde as patron of GA for going to a soccer match here in November 1938 between Ireland and Poland. A match Ireland won uh, with three, three goals to two. And there's a great picture, it's on the front cover of my, uh, my book, you can see it in the, in the bar here as well, um, of Douglas Hyde being, he showed the ropes of soccer and you can see how bemused and, uh, and uh, perplexed he is about the game. It's, it's, uh, he, uh, Douglas Hyde's in the middle, you've got De Valera on one side, and then you've got Oscar Trainer, uh, who was at Minister for Post and Telegraph at the time. He was explaining to Douglas Hyde the intricacies of uh, soccer, and he himself was a, f a former professional footballer um, with Belfast Celtic, and uh, you know, a, a, a leading figure in the Irish Revolution, as well as a, a Fianna Fáil politician. There are other matches, I suppose, through, through history from this place that, are, I suppose, that resonate. Uh, the Busby Babes played here against, against Shamrock Rovers, Nazi Germany, uh, the yeah, Soviet yeah. Union. Uh, any particular moments in the history of, of, of Daily Mount Park that you think make this place so special? Well, I, th I think the Nazi Germany one stands out as well in 1936 with the, with the salute and so on. Um, but obviously then you had 1955, you had um, Ireland play Yugoslavia and that, that caused some controversy. Um, the FAI had hoped to host Yugoslavia in 1952, but the, uh, one of the leading figures in, in Irish society, in, in particularly in Dublin society, um, Archbishop John Charles McQuaid, put a stop to that and he also wanted the game in 1955 to not go ahead and there was, there was a big pressure on the FBI to to go ahead with it because you know the, the, the Catholic Church felt that Catholics were being discriminated against and they were vehemently opposed to communism and of course uh, Marshall Tito's uh, um, 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 country was a communist country in Yugoslavia at the time. It went ahead, um, Oscar Trainer was, was prominent again, he was the president of the FBI at the time, he went out and met the teams um, and uh, that, that, that's one game that stands out for me. But I, I think also the very poignant uh, moment when um, uh, Man United play Shamrock Rovers here in, uh, in 57, just months before the, um, the Munich Air disaster, and particularly with a local lad, Liam Whelan, playing for, for United um, just up the road here. Um, and and he, was, he was only going to be uh, alive for a few short mon more months. It said that there were, there were 40,000 odd people at that game, the Busby Babes. Uh, most of whom apparently paid in and some who didn't, it was packed yeah, on, yeah, the, on the terrace. Yeah. When you look at pictures of Daily Park in the, the 1980s, the, the latter games, that incredible game against Italy, 
where they're standing on the on the on the roof of the stand. Uh, you can kind of see the moment in time when when the game was outgrowing Daly Man Park, uh, if you will, by the 80s, and the movement of the of the national team to to Lansdowne Road. But the story of Dalyman Park isn't just the story of association football, it's also the story of youth culture and it's the story of music. Some of the most legendary concerts that happened on the pitch are commemorated with a series of murals in the ground. There was Tin Lizzy in 1977 on an incredible bill that included the Boomtown Rats and local punks, the Radiators from Space. The band were at the height of their meteoric rise just weeks before Bad Reputation and the gig celebrated Phil Linnett's birthday. Three years later came Bob Marley, football mad Bob Marley. Some people say that Bob kicked the football on the Daily Man pitch before that gig. Other people say the groundskeeper told him to get off. Who knows the truth? In the League of Ireland, sometimes separating fact from fiction or mythology is damn near impossible. There were other gigs too, even festivals like Sunstroke in the early 1990s when grunge music was at the height of its popularity. Smells like teen spirit and all of that. Bands like Faith No More and even the hip hop star Ice Cube took to the pitch in Daily Mount Park. On that occasion, the Daily Mount roar proved a little bit too loud for the locals. Sunstroke was eventually moved to the RDS, but just like grunge music, well, it was running out of time anyway. And amidst the vision of Archibald Leach in the later floodlights of the 1960s, we have the brutalist Fibsborough Shopping Centre. In its own way, it's won the hearts of football fans too. But it's a reminder just how embedded Daily Man Park is within Fibsborough. Something as truly international as Euro 2020, well, it shines a spotlight on the greatest players in the world. And some of the finest players in the history of soccer have graced the Daily Mount Park pitch. Zinedine Zidane and Pelé both played here. I think for the locals though, the name Jackie Jemison means more. One local lad who's played on this pitch was Cabra's own Liam Whelan, one of the Busby babes, the iconic Manchester United team assembled by the great Matt Busby. And more than 45,000 people somehow packed into Daily Mount Park to watch United take on Shamrock Rovers. They won the game 6-0, but Matt Busby insisted that the Shamrock boys played some good football and gave a fine account of themselves. The return leg in Manchester was a lot closer, by the way. Liam's journey began with home farm before he meant and made the leap to the game at the top level in England. And it's a reminder that so many great football stories will they begin on that local level. Well, the very first international that was played in Dublin was actually 1901. It was Ireland against England. And Dalyman Park was, you know, just at, had been constructed, and but it was felt it should be held in Lansdowne Road because it would hold a bigger crowd. And that, that, that is what was happening over the decades. That, um, you, and there are so many great images of Daily Mount Park as packed to the rafters of people. Obviously, again, so many health and safety uh, <laughs> um, um, requirements. Um, and yeah, that, that's one of the reasons why Lansdowne Road has become, and Aviva, since Aviva, become the, the home of, uh, of internationals now. As a, as a historian of, of sport and its place in, in Irish society, uh, how important do you think going forward is that you know, rather than constructing something new and somewhere new, that the, this place, it's fair to call this, do you feel, the, the beating heart of Irish football or even the, the soul of Irish football? Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, th these are historical uh, um, um, places. Um, they've got so much uh, colour and history. Like, I love being in, you know, the, we're in here in the dressing room, in the bar, you know, in the shop. It's just, it's so much history and so much uh, colour here. And Cormac, not just in terms of, of soccer, but, you know, sport in the broadest sense, this part of Dublin really resonates. It, it's in many ways, it's the birthplace of so many sports. Yeah, if I can steal your phrase, Don, you can actually call it the sporting quarter of, of Dublin. Really, you know, you're a ten-minute walk from Croke Park, the home of the GA, and you're only a stone's throw away from the Phoenix Park, which has you know been the home of, of many sports such as cricket and polo and so on. 
that it really is uh, such an important historical area for sport in this country. And of course, Bohemians born in the in, in the Gate Lodge uh, off of the Phoenix Park. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But also Patrick O'Connell was, was local to here too. I mean, there's a huge amount of sporting heritage uh, in this part of the city. Yeah, Patrick O'Connell, the man who uh, saved Barcelona, was, was born very close to Croke Park in Fitzroy Avenue. And uh, you know, he obviously played many games here uh, for Ireland um, um, you know, in Daly Mount Park. I think it's remarkable when you look at the, the footage of Daly Mount Park in the 1980s, you know, tens of thousands of people mm. at that famous clash with, with the Italians. Uh, it's probably fair to say that Irish football, or Dublin football, outgrew Daly Mount Park uh, in a sense. And there's something quite nice about the redevelopment of of this place going forwards, the the idea that we can have a daily mount that's that's fit for football as she is in Dublin today. Yeah, no, absolutely, and uh, you know, I, I, we have to remember the eighties was when the, the great success of, of uh, Irish football really kind of kicked off with the chart in the era, and there was huge demand and huge interest in football. Uh, um, you know, that had, probably hadn't been experienced before, particularly of the international games. Um, and yeah, and I, I, I do like to you know the, the memories or the pictures of seeing those. You know, huge crowds packed into Daly Mount Park, you know, obviously against health and safety uh, <laughs> regulations. Um, but it, there's, there's a great kind of charm and history to that. And it, it, is, it is something that I hope remains within the future of Daly Mount Park. That kind of uh, what it is and what it stood for in the past. And uh, that, that kind of sense of history remains in the ground going forward. The story of the Irish national team is deeply connected to Daly Mount Park, indeed, right up to the Jack Charlton era, and even in its earliest days, the Irish national team were playing here. The first international in Daly Mount happened in 1904, the very early days of the ground, and at a time when soccer in Ireland was very much dominated by Belfast. It showed the commitment of Dubliners to the game. There have been some incredibly memorable international clashes here, Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, who fell victim to a Don Givens hat-trick in 1974. And even into the 1980s, 40,000 of us came to watch the Italians play here. That day, Liam Brady, Inter Milan star, lined out for the boys in green. Jack Charlton, well, the last game of Charlton's team was a victory over Morocco in 1990. But some of the beloved stars of the Charlton era, including the great Paul McGrath, made their international debuts on the Daily Mount Park pitch. In the collective memory of Ireland, what does Jack Charlton mean? Well, it means the elation of Italia 1990. I missed Italia 90, I was in Italy at the time, so said Con Houlihan. Then there was the great USA 94. He brought us to places we had never been before. But in the Charlton era story, Daily Mount Park matters too. So Daniel, we're going to be talking, I suppose, primarily about the future and how this community is changing the role of football in, in Fitzburgh going forwards. But you are someone who has a real sense of the, the history uh, of this place. You look like an antiques dealer, if I want to be here. This is a kind of selection of, of uh, Daily Mount uh, ephemera. So could you talk us through, I suppose, the, 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 the broad story of, of the history of this place and how important that is? Yeah, it was, uh, it was common in land, really, before, uh, before Bohemians came here in, in 1901. It was just common land known as Pisser Dignam's Field. And, uh, you know, any accounts of it in the day, there was a mix of kind of rubbish. There was people growing things there. And it, was, it was just, a, you know, a bit of scrap land, really. And, uh, and it slowly developed into Daly Mount Park from then. But, but the change actually happened quite quickly. And you see, like, in 1927, the board of the club, it's, it's only 25 years the club's established, like, the club is based in Daly Mount, and they raise a lot of money. Um, at the time, I think it was over £15,000. Uh, and they begin to have real plans to develop what at the time was a world-class football stadium, um, working with Archibald Leith, and developing, when I mean, you see even pictures in the 1950s, Daly Mount is, is, by international standards, an extremely good football ground. And uh, what's brilliant for me about it is just where it is geographically. It's, it's in between Edwardian houses, down laneways, and it's, sort of, it's, it's almost like something from a comic strip when you see it today, with kind of red brick chimneys surrounding it on three sides. One thing I love about Daily Mount is if it, if it weren't for the, the floodlights, you wouldn't know it was here. It's almost kind of submerged within the, the Fitzburgh community. 
Yeah, submerged is a great word for it. So even with the lights, a lot of people uh, in the area, and thankfully becoming less so, but, but there are a lot of people who've never been. I think I remember as a kid coming down and, and it's sort of special when you walk down and you see the lights come over the tops of the houses and you come down the laneway and, you know, behind the door is a different world, you know, and the, the world of, of kind of concrete and, and brick that you've just seen, you know, changes to a stadium. I think that's really special about Daily Mount. And I think a lot of people, you know, from other clubs and people who remember coming to internationals, there's great memories of the place. And I think that's one of the key reasons for it. It is an oasis in the middle of the sea. And you have a kind of assortment of great Daily Mount moments here. I'm just struck by the the colours, the, the, the vivid design. We have kind of classic Ireland match day programmes, uh, Bohemians as well. One that really stands out for me, uh, I see the, the, the floodlights, Bohemians uh, versus Arsenal. That's a real iconic piece of Daily Mount imagery. Yeah, it absolutely is. We've used that image on, on shirts, uh, you know, in the, in the very recent past. And I think the, when the floodlights went up, it seemed to change for a lot of people what, what you know, Daily Mount was on a match night. You'd move obviously to games in the evening. And I think for a lot of Bose fans, they, that's my best memories of coming to Daily Mount. They're actually on a cold night with the lights on. And that, unfortunately, that has been lost too with the move to summer football. There's less and less games where you need the lights for the duration of the game. And I think most people will, will have happy memories of going to a game with lights on for the whole evening. It, like you'd mentioned, kind of coming into to, you know, a, a theatre, really. When you've lights on, everything else disappears in the background. In terms of Daily Mount Park today, it's very clear that uh, this football club is now positioned within a community. And for you... Uh, the, the Bohemians and, and Fibsborough, and Daily Man Park and Fibsborough, I should say, are just deeply intertwined now. A lot of work that has gone on to make that happen. With Bohemians being a members own club for so long, this, the strength of the club has to come from the community and the people that support it. Without that, they are the investors, for want of a better term. You know, and the more people that we have who feel an affinity to the club, the stronger the club is. And that allows it to compete on the pitch, but also to do good things off the pitch. So without the support of, of people in Dublin, in Dublin 7 in particular, and Dublin 1, um, you know, that weakens the base of the club. So it has to fit into the local area and it has to be something that people have a sense of, of uh, respect for, pride in and hopefully want to become involved with. Daily Mount has changed a lot from, from 1901. You know, Leach changed, changed it. It's going to change again. Uh, looking at, at the, the, the potential plans of where this place will go in the future. It's very exciting, not just for Bohemians, but in a broader sense for, for Shelburne and for football in Dublin too. Yeah, it's usually exciting. I think, you know, it, I think a lot of people, me included, will be, will be, uh, be quite emotional. I think it's to see the lights come down, I think it'll be a, a turning point. This year, in 2021, we're going to see the removal of the, of the Connock Street side, you know, and that's been there for, for a very long time, 60, 70 years. So um, I think the new Daily Mode offers a lot. It offers the club a platform to grow into a new phase. But I think that certain, there will be a certain sense of loss. Euro 2020 offers us a unique chance to think about football and its place in the lives of our city and indeed our country. The National Football Exhibition, which celebrated 60 years of the UEFA European Championship and Irish football, tapped into our deep sense of pride in the history and heritage of our game. Initiatives like the Arts Legacy Project, the Street Legends Campaign, bringing football back to its roots, are part of that vision too. Dublin prepares to extend a cave meal of vulture to football fans visiting this city from Poland, Sweden and Slovakia. And they will get a taste of the great football heritage of this city. Daily Mount Park has witnessed some incredible days and has a remarkable history. But a new chapter in this story is about to begin.